of skip this a little bit because you guys know who I am. I always feel like somebody's watching me because I printed out a little ahead of myself and I put it up on my computer next to my webcam. Uh, my real name is Robert H. Stewart IV. Um, Chuck came from my grandmother, who I love dearly. Um, she was the first person to hold me up to my mom and dad and said, this is my Chucky, and it's stuck ever since. So that's where Chucky comes from, or Chuck. Um, native PA resident. Um, I actually grew up in the Plymouth Meeting King of Prussia area, uh, with the school of Hampton University, and um, married the love of my life, which was, uh, her name is Soraya, and um, I came up to the Poconos because she was up here. So that's how I got up to Stroudsburg. Um, we talked about the education, went to Hampton University, loved that school, loved ESU as well, and uh, started Computer Techies LLC, Computer Consulting Firm. We have four employees, um, and we do everything from networking, support, and uh, training. And our biggest client, School District of Philadelphia, School District of Camden. And uh, if you have any questions about technology as well, we'll have to answer that after the presentation, especially cloud computing, anything like that. We've got to help you out with that. Uh, I purchased my first 3D printer, which is a solid boot 3, for $799 after um, a tech event in New York. And it's interesting about the tech event in New York. It's a 3D printer expo. I would say definitely go to it. It is a yearly event. It doesn't cost anything to uh, register if you want to go. They do have different paid tracks, but they're really not worth it in my opinion. Um, I was in one track, and Joni stood up and said, Hi, I'm Joni. I'm the chair of the art department here at ESU, and asked a question in the session. And I thought I was the only one from Stroudsburg at this tech event for 3D printing. And that's how the intersection from ESU to myself came about. Um, I've worked a lot with ESU. I'm kind of a little advocate here. And um, I was graciously uh, awarded um, the ability to serve on the strategic planning committee with Dr. Welch here. So we were talking about what are, how can we make sure that our ESU students and Stroudsburg is competitive in the next one, three, five, ten years now. Uh, so I am an ESU advocate. As far as hobbies, I like everything uh, that's tech, that's kind of a given, but I also fly stunt kites and used to build stunt kites, so if you see the guy down the shore with huge kites that are flying, that's me. Also love barbecuing, well-rounded guy, uh, and that's me in a nutshell. Okay, so what is 3D printing, why is it important, and the, the revolution will not be televised. Everything that's happening with social networking and movements of disruption in technology are not on the TV. Um, I would highly say that get involved with your community, get involved with artists, get involved with people who make things and engineers. This is where 3D printing is really going to impact uh, a lot of people. Uh, and it will begin with makers in 3D printing, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a quick second. <coughs> okay, so. What is 3D printing? This is the technical definition of 3D printing. Okay? 3D printing or additive manufacturing is a process of making three-dimensional solid objects of virtually any shape from a digital model. When we say a digital model, we're just talking about something that's on the computer. Um, you know, 3D printing is achieved using additive process. We've talked about that with successive layers of material that are laid down in different shapes to form a solid object. Right? So, if I have uh, any object here, I'll take this object. This object is actually a free file you can download off the internet and print for free. Right? All you have to have is a printer. And if you take a close look at this after the presentation, you'll notice that it's layers, different layers. So basically, there is a hot end that goes around and can dumps different layers of plastic, thin, thin, thin layers of plastic until it makes an object. You can make objects light, you can make objects kind of solid. This is a part that I made for a 3D printer that I'm building right now, and I put magnets inside it. You can make them fragile, tight. This is ABS plastic, very similar to what they make labels out of. So I can pass this stuff around if you want to see it. Oh, sure.
So that's kind of like the technical definition of, of, of 3D printing, right? It's considered distinct from traditional manufacturing, um, you know, which mostly relies on the subtractive process. We talked about removal, like taking a log and chipping away till you get the figure you want. Um, the one thing that 3D printing does very well, the traditional manufacturing does not do well, is speed. You can actually get stuff done very rapidly. Okay, this source was Wikipedia. Here's my simplified definition of 3D printing. Um, it's basically the process of building an object layer upon layer until you know uh, the material, layer, layer upon layer of material until the object is formed, until it's completed. Okay, here are the key words with 3D printing, especially if you go out and buy a 3D printer or you build one, because 3D printers are open source. There are certain open source 3D printers. Um, and we'll get into that, but for example, a MakerBot replicator, which is the standard across the board, they're like the apple of 3D printers, okay? Doesn't mean they're better, but they're good. They're the apple of 3D printers. It'll run you about $3,000. If you spend about $800 and you have some time, you can source all the parts yourself and build something very similar that will perform just as well, right? Um, but the key words here are layers and material, okay? When we start throwing around the tech jargon. Um, materials can be anything. Plastic, silver, brass, sandstone, which is almost like a sand. Uh, imagine taking some sand from the beach and putting some glue on it and you get a hard sand ball. That's what sandstone feels like. Concrete for printing houses. Right now, they're printing houses in China for $5,000 a house. I forget what the square footage is, and it takes about 48 hours to build the house. These are from foundation, walls, they insert the windows, everything comes out of a concrete 3D printer. And that printer is about the size of this room, with a big boom on it, and that boom swings from left to right, depositing layers of concrete in a certain way, and once that concrete hardens up, you have a house. If you're in a third world country where you don't have a lot of resources or money, you know, to build a million dollar house, you can build something very, very fast, very, very quickly, and very, very cheaply. Um, bio tissue, bio paper. This is a really hot thing right now where you're actually taking um, a sample of someone's skin or blood and you are layering cells together with a 3D printer. Imagine replacing your liver a customized liver to see exact shape and size and um, structure uh, of your body chemistry. That is coming. That is coming. And this is me. I was up at MIT and saw some of this stuff is coming. Just so you know, it really, really is. Um, conductive ink, which is ink that carries electrons. So if you have a piece of wire, we all know, you know, like if you have an extension cord, you plug it in the wall and then you plug your appliance into that. Imagine being able to draw something like this out of a pen like this, and I can put a battery up here, and I can put a light up here, and I just put the battery here and the cord here, and it, this is actually a circuit. They're having ink printable circuits. And the real interesting part about this is when you mix different uh, plastics, different materials with ink printed circuits. So for example, if I printed out a speaker, I wish I had one here. This is a little better example of a layer, so I'm going to pass that out too. If I printed out a speaker, and that speaker had a coil in it, it was made of a conductive ink, I can then print a whole speaker in one shot. Right? Rather than having a magnet and copper and you know, different um, electronics in it. I can print all that at one time. Um, sugar. There was a great, great 3D printer. Every object you see right here can be edible, and it tastes like a, um, like a pop tart. It tastes like a, a sweet tart, where they're actually printing out food now. And they're even printing sugar-free stuff. So when you think of materials, materials can be anything. It can be anything. OK, layer height a.k.a. thickness, determines the resolution of a printed object, okay? You can tell that that resolution is a little different from that resolution. Um, so when we think of 
resolution or how fine the details are in the objects, I want you to think about how you can think of, this. Think of a photo. 2 megapixel camera versus a 24 megapixel camera. Okay? Low res 3D printers, they measure their resolution in millimeters, and they start at 3 millimeters. So three millimeters thin is where that layer starts. Right? Now the thinner the layer, the more detail I can get in the print. High-res 3D printers, which will cost you anywhere from $500,000 up to $1.2 million, they start at 1,000 microns. Right? So 1,000 microns equals one millimeter. So if you really want that fine, fine detail, you need to get something that prints a lot higher resolution. And I, I have some examples of uh, high, high resolution prints with me as well. So when it comes to 3D printing, thin is in. Right? The thinner I can lay that material, the better I find. Let's take a look at sample resolution heights. And this will give you an idea of what I was talking about in detail. So at 0.3 millimeters, you can see the ridges within print. Right? The item that I was passing around, you can see the ridges within the print. That is a 0.3 millimeter print right there. It came off the print. Now your nozzle has a certain uh, diameter, and that's how it extrudes the plastic. Right? If I move that nozzle faster, I can get a thinner model. There, that's why I go to the point two of it. So I'm not changing the physical property of the printer. I'm just moving this plastic faster. Okay? And then you can see you go to point one, and then there becomes a theoretical limit where the printer, no matter how precise you have it moving, it cannot really manage the plastic that's coming out of it. And you start to get artifacts, but you can still get the, you know, High resolution. So low resolution, medium, high resolution, it's easy to see a difference. Okay, why is 3D printing important? We've kind of talked about this. Disruptive technology. Anytime you can cut costs where people who used to own that space can no longer own that space, uh, you have something that is really interesting. And it's primarily due to cost. Those really expensive 3D printers that were reserved for the high-end architect firms, the high-end engineering firms. Now we can do the same type of thing right at our desktop. Um, significantly decreases R&D processing time. Normally, if I wanted to have a prototype of an object that I needed, let's say it was a manifold for a car engine, normally I would have to send that out to somebody, wait for them to process it, send me back the part. Now I can hit file print and get a replica of that part the same way I would print out you know, a paper. Um, hours instead of weeks, and ideas can be in the form of, you know, speed of thought. So anything you think about, you can actually make it happen. Um, you know, what we're doing is we're giving the manufacturing and innovation ideas to the layman. If you wanted to right now print out a new cell phone case every day, you could. If you wanted to print out a new dog tag, for your dog, you could. If you wanted to take a picture of yourself and customize that cell phone case with your picture on the back of it sticking out of the cell phone case, you could. My son wanted a cell phone case that had Dota 2 on it, which is a, a game that he plays, okay? I don't know much about the game, but he sent me the file of what the little symbol looked like, and we printed it out, made it an iPhone case. So on the back of his iPhone case, he has that Dota symbol. Very interesting story about this with uh, the disruption, especially innovative in manufacturing. I met one of my um, one of my clients, called me up and said, "Hey Chuck, I need your help." I said, "Okay, what's going on? I, I really need your help." No problem. Said, what do you want to do? I need you to come up to New York with me because my son has to get a 3D printer. He's really into it. And um, actually, my uncle Don that came with me to New York to my client. Come to find out, he actually uh, her son said, we're going to get into 3D printing, started selling customized cell phone cases before he actually owned the printer, okay? In his school colors, and was taking orders. Got the printer, 
um, you know, we parted our ways. I get another call directly from the son this time. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, I need your help. I, need your help. I can't get this 3D printer pretty. You just bought it. It's brand new. It's fine. You can't get it. Could you please, please come over and don't tell my mom? Now, I gotta tell your mom. Okay, but I'll come over. Come to find out, he has a thousand dollars in cash in a box under his bed from orders for 3D printers for his high school. He's also talking to the school store to be the student body that prints out 3D objects for the school. That's disruptive technology. I mean, he's just lucky his parents could throw out three thousand dollars like that to get something, but. That's where this is going when I mean disruptive technology, okay? So, in status quo, hey, all that stuff is gone. I can now make the part I need, replace the parts. I can now make a better part. I can take an existing design and make it better. I can become a manufacturer of things. If each one of us had a 3D printer right now, we could open up our own little store, and our output is just based on the number of printing, printers we have, right? Let's talk a little bit about different types of 3D printers. Because there's like a vector DX, serotonin, and powder bag, color bag. And out of all these three, the only one that's in full color is powder bag. Okay, so FFF or AKA FDM. These are printers that are open sourced, where you can actually get the plans online for free, build them yourself. Um, FFF is used for the fabrication. Basically, you get a spool of plastic or a spool of labeling. They even have now stretchable filaments. They call this sub filament that you feed into your printer. This feeds into a nozzle. The nozzle gets hot. The temperature is anywhere from 190 degrees up to about 225 degrees. And it begins to drip out of the nozzle. And once you have your object, you send it to the printer, and then the nozzle moves around in an XY coordinate, and the bit moves down. And it actually, layer upon layer, makes that object. That's how all these objects are printed. Stratasys, uh, which is a competitor to the 3D system, is kind of only the FDM name. So in the open source world, you'll hear FFF. Um, in the Stratasys world, you'll and this is just explaining uh, it's a picture of what I just explained. We have that filament spool, single color, right? Goes through an extruder, extruder heats up, and it is the, the uh, filament actually is forced through the nozzle and it moves back and forth on a print bed. And depending on how big this bed is, is how big your object can be. Uh, my solid doodle is 8 inches by 8 inches by 8 inches. So I can print something with that uh, form factor. That's the biggest object I can use. There are printers that I've seen people make that are 24 inches by 24 inches by 24 inches. So they can pick, print bigger things. Okay? Um, this is basically how all of your consumer grade level printers print. So if you wanted to print an object of multiple colors, this is a gentleman I met at Lehigh University. Um, interesting, he graduated high school, decided not to go to college, which I thought was very interesting. He took some of the money that he had saved for college and bought a 3D printer. He bought a really expensive 3D printer. And this is now his business card. Um, just thought it was kind of interesting because I think he is 17 years old and he's already started printing out his own business. And Keystone College is now giving him work to print stuff for them because he has the equivalent printer. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, I'll just pass the card around just so you can see what the card is like. And that's Fuse Deposition Model. Okay? It's affordable technology. It's customer friendly. Supplies are very inexpensive. Um, Spools are sold in 2.2 pounds of filament, they call it. Just to give you an example of how cheap this stuff is, this spool of filament 
is PLA, eco-friendly uh, plastic. Cost about on Amazon, I would say anywhere between $29 and $35, okay? This one spool can print out 1,500 of these bracelets in one spool. Now, if you go to New York, MakerBot is charging $5 a bracelet. Um, I'm printing these out for the neighborhood kids and friends of all different colors and people want you know, on the modern colors and stuff, but that just gives you an idea. If I can print 1,500 of these on one spool, um, this is really some good stuff. So that's how inexpensive the supplies are. And that's really your biggest supply um, cost with this type of printer. Um, <coughs> everybody's probably heard of MakerBot. He designed a MakerBot cupcake, made it open source. He started selling kits of 3D printers. Um, when he made the kit open source, it meant that you did not have to buy the parts from him. You could just download the plans, go get the parts yourself, and then make your own 3D printer. And he was acquired by Stratasys. That company was acquired by Stratasys for 400 plus million. They're not really telling you exactly what it is, but it's interesting how an open source, share the information type of person made something that was simple, um, gave it away for free, and then got bought for $400 million. Um, just really interesting. So I think if a company is willing to pay for something that's free, and they're willing to pay about $400 million, there's something going on here. There's, there's something going on here. These are the founders of MakerBot, Zach, Adam, and Gray. From what I understand, this picture was taken at 3 in the morning in Brooklyn, New York, because MakerBot's based in Brooklyn, when they finally got this thing working at 100%. Okay. Um, and like I said, the printers are still made in Brooklyn today. Uh, they originally sold as kits. You know, everything was open source. Buy your own parts. It was the information was given away for free. I really recommend for schools buy the parts, put it together, and then have a 3D print club. And you know, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, you will learn. Same type of thought process, right? Stereo lithography. Another type of 3D print, right? It uses a laser and a curing um, solution. Basically, you have a laser. So a scanner system that moves the beam around. You have your liquid resin in a reservoir, right? Your build capacity is um, controlled by how big this reservoir is. As the laser beam cures the resin, the plunger moves down, and you slowly have a part. And after the part is finished, it moves up, and as we saw in the video, the part is extracted. SLA. SL is very, very high quality, fine detail prints. These printers in general cost anywhere from $500,000 and up. There is a company that put out a open source, quote unquote, 3D stereolithography printer and recently got sued by 3D Systems. They were three guys out of MIT. Um, and now they're doing a deal with 3D systems because their printer costs three thousand dollars, and it sits on your desk, versus the five hundred thousand dollar printer. We're at the beginning of disruptive technology. We're at the beginning. Ultra high resolution parts. Okay, um, uses a resin. Here's some stuff I made on my solid tool. You see some of the stuff here. <coughs> and this is pennies on the dollar. Remember, I bought my printer for $799. Um, you have to do some modification and tweaking, but you can basically print anything you want. That's actually, this is actually Carter's head. We did a 3D scan of Carter's head uh, before we got Carter's head. So, this is a support material that is regular plastic because you can't like print over a cliff. So you need something to hold that up there. 
That's what that support material is. Software takes care of all that, by the way. All you do is design the object. The software will figure out where I need overhangs and supports and that sort of thing. Um, Jonathan Weber, his head. This is a great guy. He's sitting in the back. <laughs> awesome dude. You got to talk to Jonathan. Um, we scanned his head. We all took a trip up to New York together. Printed it on my printer. Um, you've seen the Boz. That is a Thingiverse object. Most of these objects are free. Um, we deal with a company called AKD Technologies, and we provide their IT support and infrastructure and design. And uh, I was having dinner with the owner, and I said, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I made him a couple keychains? Uh, when I talked to his secretary to set up the dinner, he said, oh, yeah, Larry's getting ready to get into clothing. He wants to do this clothing company, M MMG Clothing. OK, cool. I don't know anything about clothing. But I printed up some dog tags for him. And now he attaches these to every art clothing book he sells. Right? I'm making this on my $799 printer. That's the $799. Um, these are cones or picks of paint. I got this design free off the internet, and I just put the spongy face, because I remember when I was a kid, sometimes my hair it would hurt, and I would call it the pick of paint. So we don't buy cones anymore. We really don't. I mean, not just because of this, but we really don't buy combs anymore. Even more stuff, and I'm not going to bore you to death with all this stuff. This is a vase uh, that sits in my daughter's room. She had a glass vase. Glass vase broke. No problem. We'll print you out a new vase. Well, Dad, I, like, I want it to be stars, because I love stars. Fine, we'll take a star. We'll put it in the program. We'll pull that star up. We'll twist it and we'll make a box. That's what we did in the software. She gave me the star, a little help from daddy, and we extruded that star, pulled it, and twisted it. And how much was the software to make this? Zero. Um, we have a cat. The cat is an outdoor cat. The cat lives under the deck. The cat has been living under the deck since we moved in Stroudsburg. We dropped the cat's bowl one day. It was ceramic. Our cat's name is Trouble Cat. You ever come over, the cat will look at you, and then we'll just walk away and sit and watch you. But we'll not come in the house. You can have the door wide open. Even with all that snow, Trouble Cat did not come in the house. Since we needed a new bowl, we put it in the bowl. And we kind of you know, personalized it with Trouble Cat. Just want to give you some ideas you can, you can do with this stuff. That's our boss. Um, cell phone cases. You have a company logo, you want a cell phone case, you can make it real simple. You can make it real simple. Uh, Keychains, do this all the time. Chuck, different keys, I'll do this just all the time. This is me taking a picture of myself doing a Instagram facing with uh, one of my first cases. This is that vase, the Kosh vase, the red one, just in white. We did some interesting stuff with this. We took this vase, and I'll show it to you. We put some lights underneath it, and as the lights rotate in color, the vase changes color since it's white. And we made it very, very thin. They call it, there's walls, you know, the thickness of the wall. If you look at this versus those objects over there, you'll see how much thicker this is, right? So we have a thicker wall. If you make the wall real thin, then light can go through. And if you have LEDs, then you can change the color of the box. There's different things you want to think about. And that's watertight, by the way. That's watertight. Um, needed a key rack because I kept on losing the keys in the house. I printed out a key rack. This was a free file on the web. The only thing I did was put keys on it, and I added like one or two extra pegs. And the holes. Sorry. And uh, I just tapped it up, and now that's our key rack. So when something breaks, design it. When, some, when you want something you want to think about, make it. Kids love this stuff. My five-year-old daughter will draw something, and we can make it 3D and print it out. She is in another world. There's almost a, a, it's a different type of engagement, different way of thinking. And I really think there's a big bridge between this and education, 3D printing and education, technology and education. Um, <laughs> You know, in the United States, we're a consumer-oriented 
culture. I got to have it. I got to have it. How about I got to design it and clean it? Right? Something to think about. These braces, that's in the pink and the green. It's my daughter, Sam. My friend plays for a reggae band called Ja People down in Philly. He needed a way to promote the band. I took a copy of the guitar, punched Ja People through it. He's Dean the bassist, so we put his name right here in the neck of the bass. And we printed out a bunch of them and mailed it to him and said, I hope this helps. They went like hotcakes. So customization is free. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. It's free. Um, like I said, we're in a revolution and we're changing. Um, disruption, um, 3D printing education and free software. This is some good stuff because, like I said, since we don't have the grab bags, which I apologize for, if you use any of this software and you send me your STL file, I will gladly print it for you for free. Um, let's talk about some of the low-cost software that maximizes benefit for 3D printing and education. Okay. If we talk about 3D printing in the classroom, this is where I think there is a big bridge. I also think there's a big opportunity um, to leverage 3D printing and education. Something that really struck me uh, one day is, and I'll show you the website, Smithsonian. <coughs> is now giving away for free their CAD files of scanned artifacts. So when I thought about this, I thought about, wow, wouldn't it be cool for a teacher who's talking about mummification to print out an actual replica of a mummy and pass it around? Or print out an actual tooth of a you know, extinct animal and pass it around? I think there's some connection and opportunity there. Um, uh, you know, think about the idea of having students touch their thoughts. My daughter wanted a new vase. She happens to like stars. We drew a star. We ate dinner. After dinner, we came upstairs and we pulled that off the printer. She slept with that the first night. I thought it was odd. About 10 o'clock at night, I snuck in the room and pulled it out because it's sharp edges. But there is a certain type of engagement in education that I have never seen before with this type of technology. Um, ITEST, uh, National Science Foundation, they are offering grants to innovate, innovative programs in 3D printing. Um, NASA's given up $100,000 to another school for 3D printing that was recently in the news. Um, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. And this, I really think, is just it, it, it's a pivotal point. When you have the Smithsonian giving away their scans so that you can download and print it yourself, something's changing there. Something's happening. Here's some ideas how people are talking about how is 3D printing going to revolutionize the classroom. Um, you know, biology students can study cross sections of the heart and other organs. Chemistry students, this to me makes the most sense print out different molecules and snap them together to learn chemistry, right? Um, you know, if you really want to go there, I think this is a little far-fetched, but maybe it really isn't. Auto class students can print replacement parts or modify car parts. Makes sense, right? If you have the metal printer, then you could actually print out some new wheels. But, you know, that's going to cost you some money. Um, cooking students, you know, could design intricate molds for ices gelatins. I'm actually working right now on printing out a mold in um, FDA approved plastic, which provides a filament, and then melt some chocolate in the microwave and make my own candy bars. Maybe with my face on it. So I gave myself, who knows? I don't know. You know? But just a thought. Very cool Valentine's Day gift. I love you, honey, with, you know, some poetry and put it on your own candy bar. Okay. Um, there's a lot of different things, you know, engineering, you talk about architects, history classes, we just talked about that printing artifacts. So I really think there's a big bridge here, and I think there's a lot of opportunity. What we notice in the marketplace right now is teachers want to be able to do this, but they don't know how to do it. And then the next question is how do we get the funding to do it? But I think it's a cool idea that you can think about something, lecture on it, and actually print it out, 
and say, here's a skull, and here's the different pieces of it. So if you can think it printed, that's basically the whole idea with education. You know, there are, Stratasys is one huge company like 3D Systems. They put out a free curriculum on the web for schools that have 3D printers to help with the STEM movement in your students. What a cool way to learn. I wish that this was available when I was in school. I mean, that, that to me is phenomenal. So the whole thought of, okay, we're going to design something that's going to catapult you know, the team that can grow the furthest will win. Here's your computer, here's some design software, go to work. I mean, I think that that is just insane. We're not going to play it twice, though. <laughs> OK, so here's some free 3D design software for you and the kids. And I encourage adults to get into this as well. All this stuff is free. Um, so if you want to design something, we'll print it out for you. OK, um, for 3D modeling, I highly, highly, highly recommend Tinkercad. Tinkercad is free. It was an open source project. They were running out of money. They had to close their doors. And in April of 2003, Autodesk bought them. Interesting, right? The one thing that's nice about Tinkercad is everything is in blocks, modular blocks. Um, and I'll be glad to email this presentation to anyone and also give you a list of uh, websites as well. Um, Absolutely no software needed to run it. It runs in your web browser. I love things that run in the web browser. They're automatically saved to the cloud. I don't have to worry about it. Tinkercad.com. Actually, 90% of everything you see up here was made on Tinkercad. This was designed in Tinkercad.com. Uh, this was Tinkercad. Even this 3D at ESU was Tinkercad. And I just made this real quick before I came here. Um, Tinkercad's good stuff. Tinkercad's really good stuff. Autodesk 123D apps. An awesome, awesome suite of apps. Not only for your Mac or PC, but also for your iPhone and your iPad. They have a cool thing called Creature Creator. So if you like creatures, you get a base skeleton, and then you get to layer muscles, and move stuff around. And you can have a creature that looks like a flower. You can have a creature that looks like an ant. Really, really cool stuff. Once you get that 3D creature, um, you know, the way you want it, you can upload it and share it with other people, or you can go right from your iPad and send it to a company and they'll print it out, or if you have a 3D printer at home, you can print it right out. Really, really, really cool stuff. has a whole bunch of, um, it's, a, it's a suite of apps, very similar to Microsoft Office, Word Processor, PowerPoint, Excel, Spreadsheet, Database, it's a suite of 3D apps. Um, they've been around for a while. SketchUp Make, 100% free. It used to be called Google SketchUp. Google sold the company. Um, a lot of people use SketchUp for architecture, drawings, interior design, that sort of stuff. <coughs> SketchUp has a STL exporter, which is made for 3D printing. So, um, you know, one of the things that I like to do with my brother-in-law is try to get him, hey, your interior design major, why don't we take some of your designs and print them in 3D, and then you take that to class. You know, this has a plugin just for that. This is really, really good stuff. And here's food for thought. You know, let's start a maker movement. I'm definitely about starting something here in Stroudsburg and in Pennsylvania. So meetups, maker movements, that sort of thing. I'm really into that. If anyone wants to talk about that, let's chat on email. Let's go out to lunch and talk about it. You never know. You may see something in the innovation center happening. Um, and let's eat some candy. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. By the okay, um, I'll close with saying, let's make makers. And I'm really tied into helping kids with their dreams and their imagination and making things happen. It's something that's dear to my heart. When I first actually met ESU, uh, the one thing I wanted to have was a summer tech camp. That was something that's been in my head for a while. And uh, that's the whole reason we even started talking on the table, was to have something up here for our kids to do. Particularly things that I would think are kind of cool. Um, and hopefully kids would think it's kind of cool. Um, so, you know, in closing, I want to say, when you do explore the options with 3D printers, and you do think about yourself, and particularly the youth, make sure that we're making makers and we're making kids that think. 
and they think in different ways outside of the box. And, and let's try to bring the arts back, and let's try to bring creative thinking back, and not just have people glued to technology, even though I'm a technologist, I think it's a very important thing. So I'll close with this video. So once again, I'm Chuck Stewart. Thank you so much for your time for coming out for the rain and, and all that stuff. If you ever want to connect, please send me an email. Um, if you want to chat about any, if you have any questions or any comments you want to chat, I'll be here for about another half an hour. And I really, really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed this with uh, our talk on Thank you very much.